right. Good afternoon. Welcome to How to Use Jenkins Less. My name is Jesse Glick. I've worked at CloudBees since 2012. Uh, variety of things in Jenkins Core and some plugins, but most notably on the basic infrastructure of pipeline. Um, but I've actually been involved in the Jenkins project going back a number of years before that, in, uh, to when it was called Hudson. Uh, I did some contributions early on in things like the CVS plugin back when people still used CVS for version control and, and things like that. So, uh, so it's been really interesting to see the growth of Jenkins as an ecosystem. I think Koske in his keynote today said there were 1,400 something plugins. I can't remember the exact count. Um, but definitely a broad array of things that are out there for you to use. So what I'm going to talk about today is some kind of a little bit of a counterbalance to that. So wh why would you want to use Jenkins less? Or what do, I, what do I mean by using Jenkins less? I don't actually want you to use Jenkins less. I want you to use Jenkins all day long. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about ways that you can reduce the, the parts of Jenkins that you critically depend on. So the, the parts of Jenkins that you're really using as part of your CI CD pipeline. So this is, there's, perhaps two audiences for this. I think they overlap somewhat. But first of all, probably most of you are either Jenkins administrators or heavily involved in setting up Jenkins projects on a system that somebody else has at least started up for you. And you know, you're going to go to a bunch of talks where people say, you know, you need to use the following features of Jenkins in order to get what you want done. You know, so if you go to a talk by Artifactory people, they're going to say, well, if you use Artifactory and you use Jenkins, then you obviously need to be running the Artifactory plugin, and here's all the things that you can do using that system in order to use Artifactory. Um, I want to give you a perspective on how you can evaluate those kinds of claims in terms of what concretely are you getting from that feature, and what are you paying for it? I know most of these plugins are free, but that doesn't mean that it's free to keep on running them. And for feature contributors, so definitely that would include plugin developers, but also anybody who's sort of advising other people on best practices for using Jenkins. So if you're blogging about use, pattern, use cases and patterns in Jenkins, um, then you're affecting how other people use it and, and you should be able to, to say, are these recommendations incurring a cost that people want to pay? So there's lots of plugins and when things are going well, this is really helpful. So if you're getting started with a new technology, you look in the Jenkins Update Center, you search for that keyword, you find a plugin that matches that technology, you install it. There's a configuration form that shows you all of the options for using it. You check the things you want, you start going, and if all goes well, you'll be up and running and be productive pretty quickly. You can get updates just by selecting everything from the update center and you automatically get access to new features, new fixes. Um, and there can be pretty deep integration between plugins, so a lot of times things will be more than the sum of their parts. You can, you know, Jenkins has a very rich API, so they're, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of systems that have plugins, but basically each plugin is just a little isolated program that can't do anything except a very limited set of things. Jenkins isn't like that. It has a very, very rich API. And most of what it does, it does from plugins, and they can have all kinds of interactions, and that's usually pretty good. So what, the, what happens when things are not so good? So this is the cost part. Um, and I, I see some of these costs working at CloudBees because we, we offer commercial support contracts to people who are customers, and so they'll, they'll file support tickets if they uh, want advice on best practices for doing something, or if they run into some sort of problem, sometimes it's urgent. They might have 
updated something and then all of a sudden something is absolutely mission critical that dozens, hundreds of people are relying on is broken that day and they want to know how can I get this fixed in the next hour. But sometimes it's not so urgent, they just want to know what do you recommend we do with this. Um, and sometimes people have kind of special needs and they'll, and a lot of times uh, people who feel comfortable about it or then have a deep investment in Jenkins will propose some various kinds of fixes to plugins. And sometimes as a plugin maintainer, you'll sort of be overwhelmed by a long list of proposed changes where some of them are adding support for a, like a pretty rarely used mode of some tool or even a customized version of some tool that you don't have access to yourself. And someone is saying, hey, please make this change. You know, it works great for me. I don't know Java very well, but this seems to work, so merge, please. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can just go ahead and click merge and it's fine, but, you know, but sometimes you need to push back and say this is just too risky. Uh, where does that leave the person who submitted it? They're kind of stuck without your help, right? So there are some questions you need to ask, and I'm going to try to give, give you a, a framework for measuring these things on a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum will be, yes, use all the features you can, install everything, have fun. And the other end of the spectrum is, no, 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 just shut everything down and I, you know, I only want to use the bare minimum that I absolutely have to use. And it, it can depend on, on your circumstances. So the same, the same project might move between those extremes over the course of their usage. When you're first, start, first getting started on a project, you may be perfectly fine installing something new and experimenting with it to get started quickly. But if it's, if it's well established and suddenly a lot of people are really relying on this, you might not want to risk any changes to it. You might want to err on the conservative side. Um, depends on whether you're doing something that the developers of the Jenkins features foresaw and support or whether it's something that's really, you know, the weird legacy thing in your organization that isn't quite the way it's supposed to be but you can't change it now and you need Jenkins to integrate with it somehow. Um, the last point about attack surface, if you're very security conscious, well, you're running Jenkins, so you're running some code you didn't write and probably didn't personally read all of. So you're incurring some risk, but you probably want to minimize the amount of that code that you're running. And you probably want to be running code that most of the hundreds of thousands of Jenkins users are running and most Jenkins core developers and experienced developers have looked at and are aware of and basically approve of and not the thing that has 300 other installations besides you and hasn't been touched since 2013. You know, because who knows what, what it's doing. We get a lot of security vulnerabilities reported in the Jenkins project and some of them are from plugins that haven't really seen much use and so nobody really noticed or paid much attention. So I'm going to try to assign a somewhat arbitrary score from zero, meaning it's not actually even part of Jenkins, it's just something else you're doing. <laughs> so nothing you do to Jenkins could possibly break it, but you don't really get any advantages of integration. And score of 10 means you're all in and you, you better hope that what you, what you want to do is perfectly aligned with how this feature was supposed to be. So I'm going to start off talking about kind of the, probably the most intuitive examples that come to mind right away are builders and publishers. These are basically build steps, things you would organize in a sequence in a freestyle project or in a pipeline. They would just be function calls. Um, and so I've heard questions in a support ticket along the lines of how do I build Ruby projects in Jenkins? So. Well, the question is, how do you build Ruby projects without Jenkins? You do the same thing. Now run that in Jenkins. But what they're probably asking for is, is there 
something about building Ruby projects that Jenkins can do especially well. Are they running, I don't know, Ruby, but RSpec or something, some test results? Do they need to collect those test results and make them browsable in Jenkins? That's something that is specific to Jenkins, so they might want something specially to handle that. So what are build steps, various, various kinds of build steps. These include, I'm including publishers here, um, have different kinds of purposes. Some of them do something that's really unique and it's directly interacting with other parts of Jenkins. Others are pretty much just running some sort of stock tool but offering some checkboxes and things to help you predefine pre the options that you would pass on a command line, something like that. Um, build wrappers are things that sort of set up an environment for a bunch of other steps and often do things like set environment variables and, and, that, and start and stop services and things like that. Um, when you're talking about pipeline, these things can happen in any kind of order and any kind of, generally any kind of logic associated with it, like decisions about when to run a certain step or what arguments to pass it, that would be part of the script, really. It's not something you want to be baked into the plugin. It's something you want the script to control. Um, there, are also, there are also a few cases of dedicated project types that are designed for one specific technology. Um, I'm going to show an example of a well-known one and why it's a problem. Um, generally, really don't recommend these. Um, if you are a CloudBeast customer, there is a there is a enterprise feature called job templates that let you get some of those benefits without the costs, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So I'm, just as an example, I'm going to talk about Maven build tool because it's something I'm very familiar with and has a long history in Jenkins, but the concepts here should be pretty much the same for any kind of technology that you're running from Jenkins. Um, so one, thi one simple thing you can do is just run a shell step and you say, okay, here's MVN is the command line executable for Maven. So, okay, run MVN with the argument. Install is a typical argument. Um, there is also a pipeline specific plugin that helps you set up an environment for Maven and takes care of some of the Jenkins integration, which I'll show. From a freestyle project is a very similar situation. You can either select the option for shell step and type in MVN yourself, or you can use a, a special builder for Maven that gives some additional behaviors. Um, and then there's also a dedicated project type for Maven, which has, has some surprising effects. Uh, if you're using pipeline, then um, sort of another aspect of this is that some of the things that could have been in your main script, you can pull out into a reusable library where you define some function calls with, with various arguments, and then it winds up running the same steps, but reusable across jobs. Um, and this is, this is pretty flexible in that you can pick up a library from source control, it's not packaged in a plugin or anything, and you can pick particular versions of it. You can even go and say, um, without any prior configuration, you can say, go to such and such account on GitHub and take this repository and pull the library from it at the following git hash or tag or something like that. So very lightweight mode of picking up reusable parts of a job. So I'm going to show uh, all of these different options, and you can see what the what the impacts of it are. Um, the slides and all of the code to run the demos um, I have here is on my GitHub account. If you're in the back, you probably can't see that URL. So it's githubcom jglick jk minus minus for less of Jenkins. So. You look at some different options here for running Maven. And you, have, um, you have different builds. These are all builds of the same project, but done in different ways. 
in, in all cases, basically, it's just running, running a project and collecting some test results. They're very simple. Um, if you're using pipeline, then it's typically going to look something like this. Um, people in the back, please start screaming if the font size is intolerable. Unfortunately, this doesn't really scroll the way you'd want it to. <laughs> um, but basically, I'm going to, after checking out sources from version control, I'm going to select a Maven tool. Um, this, is, this is maybe a little bit old school Jenkins, but you can have, um, you can have various tool definitions defined in Jenkins. Um, under global tool configuration. Probably in, in more modern systems, you'd probably do this using Docker instead. Um, but here you can have some, some tools predefined in Jenkins. Um, I also have a configuration file. Maven likes to have a bunch of different configuration settings for the system that tell it things like where to proxy downloads from. Um, again, this is something that you can configure using the, uh, the config file provider plugin, and you can set up some of these global files and refer to them from jobs. And I'm also going to turn on colorized output from Maven. Then I run my actual Maven build, nothing too exciting there, and finally collect JUnit format results. So if we look at the console from this, it's going to follow exactly what, what the script just said. So um, it's going to pick up a Maven installation. It's going to pick up um, config files and set an environment variable with the location of, um, of your global settings. And then going to run the command you said with color output. And you can take, you could copy and paste this and maybe edit the location of the config file and run that from a shell if you didn't believe that Jenkins was doing the right thing. So if you ran into trouble, you have, a, you have an easy way of diagnosing. And then it records test results. Um, from Freestyle Project, it's, it's very similar. Um, the context menu doesn't really work well at this font size, but so here, I set some configuration files, I provide color, I set environment variable for the location, and then just execute shell, and ready to go. So that's going to produce, it should be pretty much identical output. Um, again, I just ran, ran the shell command exactly as I typed it in. All right, so far pretty straightforward. Um, if you decide to use the pipeline plugin for Maven, then you strip out a bunch of boilerplate. So you can see that we, we have this with Maven step that takes care of the setup of the tool. It takes care of the setup of a settings file. It predefines that. Um, so it actually, it's actually going to run a wrapper script for MVN that predefines those arguments to MVN for you so that you don't have to type those in. Um, and it's also going to insert a, an agent, which is a little runtime hook in the Maven build process um, that's going to report back to Jenkins on location of test files. And the reason for that is that um, it's going to try to automatically collect tests for you. So here's, here's all of the different options for with Maven. And you can see that you can do things like turn off test result collection. So if you leave it at the default, um, then you'll see that it gives you some diagnostic information about what it's running. Um, but eventually, it's just running the shell script you specified here. Um, try to find it in the midst of all of the other output. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really running MVN. This just happens to be a wrapper script. And then at the end, it knows where to pick up JUnit results from and record those so that when you go to the 
Um, when you go to the project page, it, it has a list of test results in Jenkins. All right, so that, so that was pretty similar, but it's doing a little bit of magic, so you might have some difficulty recreating what that wrapper script was if you ran into any problems. Right? Um, if you're going to use the library, this is actually um, a pipeline library. Um, here I'm keeping the syntax cleaner in my Jenkins file, but actually the behavior is exactly identical to the, the first pipeline example I showed. So here, the, the, um, what looks like a built-in step MVN uh, is, if you look at the content of the library, um, this is the, the library definition. So it's doing the exact same things that the, that the first project did. It's just packaging some of that stuff up into a reusable step. So you don't have to type in the same stuff for every job. Um, freestyle builder, this is, this, is, um, this is using a dedicated Maven build step, invoke top level Maven targets. Um, sounds a little bit fancier than it is. When it comes down to it, really all it's doing is running that same Maven command that we saw before. Um, but it, but it adds some, it adds some uh, highlighting into the console output so it knows where the, where the goals are and it bold faces them for legibility and things like that. But otherwise, it's basically doing the same thing. Now, the dedicated project, this is a Maven project. That means that when you went to new item, you selected Maven project as an option. Um, this looks like a bonanza when you go to the configuration screen because all I did was I set up source code and triggers, blah, 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 and then I literally didn't type anything else into the build section. This is just the default settings. I just said new item and done. Um, so that was super easy to set up and it automatically recorded test results for me. Um, but let's go and look at the console log and look at it pretty carefully. And this is the, is this the command it ran? I think so. Um, whatever this is, it's nothing that Apache project and Maven ever produced. This is all Jenkins specific stuff. So you see a bunch of libraries created by the Jenkins project. And then somewhere in there, it's actually running a customized version of Maven embedded in some other tool and so on. Most of the time, that works just fine and it does exactly what you want. But then the 5% of the time that it doesn't, you have no hope of figuring out why. So if you're using, if you, there are cer certain kinds of Maven plugins called extensions that, that sort of are added really early in the build process and those can completely clash with the Jenkins plugin of the same and it'll just give you a really cryptic error that really only a few people in the world know how to diagnose and they're not helping you today. So, so, so that's, that's one reason why I don't really recommend doing this. So how did these, how did these things stack up on a little scale? Okay, so for, for, the, um, for the basic running MVN command, I'm going to rank it as a two, so there's not too much Jenkins involvement. I did use a couple Jenkins plugins to get those managed configuration files from somewhere. Um, that was integrating with the Jenkins plugin that I'm then relying on. But basically, for the most part, it's just running a command that I could recreate by myself and I could test outside of Jenkins and, and fix any problems without knowing anything about Jenkins. Um, if you're using the, the, something like the freestyle build step for Maven or the with Maven wrapper and pipeline, so it's, Still pretty much just running the MVN executable, but there's a bunch of setup that's going on before that that you might need to understand if something goes wrong. So it's another possible point of failure. You, you get paid for it in terms of some extra features and conveniences, so you can make that, make that trade off. The de dedicated project, it's really tightly integrated into Jenkins for better and for worse. Um, 
so uh, sort of a similar situation with publishers. These are things that would be post-build actions and freestyle. They usually fall into two categories. You have your notifiers that are pretty much like builders in terms of behavior. They just do something. Um, and then recorders are typically things that do things like publish results, archive things in Jenkins. So those are generally really Jenkins specific because they're usually you know, adding something to the Jenkins UI, adding metadata to the build record, all this kind of stuff. Some, some publishers, you know, some plugins have a sort of complex combination of things. There was a Testopia plugin that was put up for adoption recently because the tool it was integrating with is deprecated. So I hope you don't, hope you're not running that. Um, but that did a sort of comp complex mixture of stuff. Sometimes it was making these uh, kind of XML RPC something calls to the service using a custom library that it bundled, and then sometimes it was publishing some test results and things like that. So if you're using that, then you get a lot of integration, but you know, if you need to fix any issue there, you, you have to be a Jenkins plugin developer to fix it. So let's take a look at what, um, what these options look like in the context of Javadoc, so Java programming, um, HTML output. Um, so if you use the Javadoc plugins, there's a plugin called Javadoc, and it exists just to add this step, publish Javadoc results. So this is just a collection of HTML files and it's adding it to your build. Otherwise, I have pretty much the same, um, the same build that I, that I showed in the other example. So you, so you run this and it goes through the build, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end it says publishing Javadoc. And if you go to the project, uh, oh, sorry, if you go to the, the job, you'll see this Javadoc link in the sidebar and and it crashes. What happened? Oh, there it is. There. So then it then it shows the the Java doc that you created in your build. Okay. So that that mostly works fine. But there's another option, which is you can use a public uh, you can use a public uh, a plugin called the HTML Publisher plugin. And HTML Publisher plugin, you can see it's just called Publish HTML. It doesn't know or care anything about Javadoc. If you want to configure it to link to a given initial file, you configure that as part of the plugin. You know, so it has, a, it has a variety of options. You can tune exactly which files you pick up, where you put them, what you label them, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so you go to this, this job. Um, they call this generic. And again, you get a Javadoc link here. And so it looks pretty much the same. I, I had to configure this tab title. That's pretty much the only difference. So, so it turns out you didn't actually need to install the Javadoc plugin for that. So that could be a good thing because there's this bug that's reported against the Javadoc plugin that occurs in certain cases when you just have one Java package. Uh, after a security fix, actually this broke because it was linking to a wrong HTML page and it wasn't set up correctly with the browser security settings and all of this stuff. Um, and it looks like I'm not online, but if you, look at, if you look at this, basically there's no easy workaround using the Javadoc plugin, but if you just switch to the HTML publisher plugin, it's easy to, easy to fix the issue. You just override one parameter. Oops. So, so definitely, you know, Javadoc plugin getting a little more specific than you really needed it to be for, for this purpose. You're just uploading some HTML files. Um, Groovy is sort of the standard Jenkins scripting language since time immemorial. Um, it's a superset of Java, so if you're Familiar with Java, that's great. If you're not familiar with Java, it's incomprehensible. Um, but it's what's been used for lots of Jenkins plugins over time, and including in pipeline. Um, 
And it, for Jenkins, it's almost always run inside the master process. So it's called in-process scripting. Um, we have a groovy runtime built right into Jenkins core, and lots of plugins submit little tasks to run in it, little things you can configure in your project or in a global config screen or something. And it's often considered a feature that it can access all of the same internal APIs that Jenkins plugins themselves use. So if you can get, if you can get Javadoc for all of the Jenkins internal APIs, um, you can do pretty much all of that stuff from a little groovy script, and it gives you a lot of power. There's, but there are downsides, of course. So um, for security reasons, we don't let just anyone run any script they want any time they want because it's a one-line groovy script to disable all security in Jenkins or make yourself a super admin or whatever you want. So we have to, we have to divide scripts into scripts that we know an administrator wrote and they can do anything and scripts everybody else, the masses wrote and those have to, every call, every function call that it makes essentially has to go through a, a checklist to see is this, is this pre-approved as being safe. Um, and that's a pretty complex system in Jenkins and when there are security reports that get, you know, security vulnerabilities that get reported about that, I sometimes wind up doing the fixes for them and it's, it's hellish. So, but in, in there, you can get a lot of problems this way. Um, there's also performance overhead for doing all of these security checks and for pipeline, there's some additional overhead for reasons I'm not going to talk about. Um, I think tomorrow, my colleague Sam Finort has another talk called Pipelines at Scale, and that talks some about the, the downsides of doing too much groovy stuff in pipelines um, that relates to this. And another, another basic thing is that scripts are just tied to the, the version of Java and Groovy that come with Jenkins for better and for worse. So you don't, you don't get to pick and choose. So if, when, when at all possible, I always say use external processes. You know, if you need to do anything that's not super simple, you're a lot safer and better off just running it on an agent somewhere. Preferably as part of your main build process, but if it has to be, if for various reasons it has to be done as a separate part, then still if you can try to try to use a feature that lets you run that as an external process, you get a lot of a lot more isolation, better performance, more flexibility. Um, Docker in particular is a godsend for any kind of configurable stuff. That of the kind that Jenkins uses a lot of because you can define the complete environment for the tool without having to worry about um, you know, trying to match up the versions of some obscure library on different machines. Um, so I'm gonna go off on a little, a little bit more of a, a, spe a less practical flight here, but a, but I think this would be interesting in terms of understanding some of the concepts. I'm going to talk about SCM integrations in Jenkins. So, well, how many people here use Git as their main SCM? Most of you, yeah, so that's what we expect. Right? Um, and we got the maintainer here, You've done a great job, thank you. It's probably super stable, you don't need to worry about it. For the other 10% of you that are using, you know, one of the less popular systems or you know, I've heard of horror cases where people have some sort of in-house version control system that they've inherited from 20 years ago and they, you know, and they can't get rid of. Um, or if you just have some kind of special needs, then where does that leave you? Um, so first of all, what does an SCM plugin do in Jenkins? I mean, we all know it checks out your sources, right? That's the basic, that's the basic bar. Um, there's some details like creden like applying credentials or stored in Jenkins maybe. But the, but the main things that it's concerned with are doing stuff like creating a change log that can be displayed in Jenkins in all kinds of different places. Um, in Blue Ocean, in the classic UI, various places it shows a change log. There will be a list of culprits associated with the build. You can have other plugins will send mail to them automatically. So you, you really wanna have that change log if you can. Most SCM plugins 
either let you pull for remote changes or have some sort of webhook support so they can be immediately notified of them. Um, that happens outside the context of the build. It's happening in between builds. It's looking for new changes on the server. Um, and if you're using multi-branch pipelines, this is a part of what we call pipeline as code, then you need to have a way of looking up all of the branches in a repository. So if you don't have any SCM plugin at all, you just don't configure any SCM in your project, what actually can you do? Well, you can still check out sources. Um, you, you're probably going to have to supply credentials somehow, but there are some generic ways of adding credentials to any kind of command. So you could do that. Um, but you're stuck there. You're not going to get any kind of change log or, or any other integration with other SCM features. So is there a middle ground? Yes. There are things called script SEM plugins. There's actually, this is Jenkins, so there's two of them and they're both unmaintained. So there's, <laughs> there's a script SEM plugin that, that does the basic stuff um, and it uses in-process Groovy scripting for some of the integration with, you know, for things like reporting the change log. And lo and behold, you know, this is an old plugin and they didn't apply any of the API changes that they needed to actually make that secure. So we've blacklisted it from the update center because if you install this on a secure Jenkins instance, it's basically five minutes before someone has taken over. So you can't do that. There's a shell script SEM plugin that doesn't have that problem, but it also doesn't really do much either. Um, so, so I, you know, decided it would be fun to try to create something that's a little bit modernized version of the same, but solve some of those problems and see, see what it looks like. So here, as an example, I'm using Mercurial version control system. I picked this as an example because I'm the maintainer of the Mercurial plugin, so I know how badly maintained it is. Because I, I don't have time to, I don't use Mercurial anymore. I used it for my previous job, but I'm still maintaining it. Um, I try to deal with pull requests when they come in, but that's not what I'm doing all day long. So if you are using the Mercurial plugin, here's a um, multi-branch branch source, and here I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go and maybe make some changes to the repository so we can see some see some things happen. Maybe start some start new builds with those changes, that sort of thing. Um, so if we have uh, some, well, here, let me show the configuration for this. So this is a multi-branch pipeline, which means that it picks up the job definition from a script called Jenkins file in the repository. So what you configure in Jenkins is the SCM details. So here, location of a mercurial repository, that's about it. And if you go to a build of it, you'll see um, here's build number two. It was triggered by Jenkins looking for and finding some new changes. And it has a change log that shows up in the Jenkins UI, everything like you expect. And from the console output, so it's running this long series of, of commands to to do various things that, you know, setting up, creating a change log for this build compared to the previous build, all this kind of stuff. All pretty much works as long as you, that's what you wanted to do if you're not doing anything really weird with Mercurial. So the question is, can we, can we get away from having a Mercurial plugin? And the answer is yes, if you really want to. So here we have what we call a user space SCM plugin, and the configuration for it is the name of a Docker image. And this could include a tag or something like that. So if, you, um, are, if, if you're nervous about updating plugins because you've got dozens of different teams that are doing very different things, well, you don't actually need to update all of their configurations. You just have this one very generic plugin that's unlikely to change much and different teams can use different versions of this image. You configure it with something, 
the, the Jenkins plugin has no idea what this means. This is up to you to interpret. And how does it work? So it, it found that there was a default branch again, and it found some changes. It created a change log, did pretty much all of the same things. You know, it checked out and updated sources, but how is that all working? So let's, let's take a look at this, this image, and I hope, I hope most of you have, some, have like a little bit of familiarity with Docker at least, but very briefly, um, Docker file, maybe I should make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so Docker file, this defines, uh, it, this defines basically the whole operating system almost. So a version of Ubuntu Linux, I'm pinning it down to a particular timestamp because I don't wanna take any chances here. I wanna know exactly what I'm getting. Um, I'm pinning it to a particular version of Mercurial that I've pre-tested. So I wanna just use the latest or something. Um, install Mercurial and then everything that, that it runs is, in this case, just comes down to this roughly one page long bash script. I wrote this in bash just because it was quick enough, but actually you might, Mercurial itself is written in Python, you might have actually wanted to write this in Python. Nowhere here do you need to no Java, much less no Jenkins APIs. So every, even this really scary long command, this is just the result of a couple of hours reading the Mercurial man page and playing with documented options to it, okay? Um, so what all is this doing? It's getting a command and then, and then you can actually test some of the things that it's doing offline, so if I don't wanna, even run Jenkins, I can just try, whoops, I can just try seeing what this, what this does standalone, and you can see that it works correctly. If I wanna make some, um, if I want to make some changes to what it does, then all I need to do is edit this, say that I want to dump the mercurial configuration, that's a debug config command. Um, I actually need to, redirect to standard error so it doesn't get misinterpreted as output. Um, so here I'm getting debug output as part of Mercurial. So if I go back to the branch indexing and run it, then I haven't restarted Jenkins or updated any plugins or anything, but you can see that I'm, I'm running sort of a different implementation of, of my SCM that now has debug output for it. So that's, that's the basic idea of that. So you can, you can actually get away with not relying on a, a dedicated SCM plugin if you really don't wanna take that risk. So it's, that's about all I have time for. I have some other, other slides if people are interested in reading them offline, but um, I will link to the location of both the slides and the, the demos for it. So this is a, a demo that you can run yourself locally if you wanna play with some of the options. I'll tweet out the, the links for this to the hashtag Jenkins world. Um, we have some time for questions. I'd love to take some, yes. Uh, yes, so the question was whether you can get polling support in this mode, and the answer is yes, you can. So um, that's just two commands here. One is identify, so this is saying um, give me the revision of this checkout, whatever that means to you. In the case of Mercurial, it's a id command. And then compare says um, given a baseline and a new proposed revision that might be out there on a remote server somewhere, um, tell me if there are interesting changes that I should pull. And so it can either say none or significant. So yes, polling does work in this. If you push some changes, it'll index and, and trigger a new build from it. So I, the, this is sort of the very basics of an SCM plugin and most most production grade SCM plugins have a lot more niceties and integrations. So you get, depends on how much you, you can give up.
-hmm. So the question was whether Cloud Bees, or I'll reinterpret it to mean Jenkins project in general, um, is will provide any kind of scoring of plugins. And if, I mean, that's a very subjective thing. There's a lot of different criteria that you could use to score plugins. Um, well, there, maybe there's two answers to that. One is that as of Jenkins 2, we're sort of offering a list of recommended plugins that lots of people want in the setup wizard. So that's sort of, that's a basic cut on that. Um, we've also, in the Jenkins project, started collecting much richer data about people's usage of things. So we have not just installation counts, but we have information about like, which versions of Jenkins core people are using it with, and, and we can do some more reporting on, on things like that. Um, CloudBees is also has an assurance program where we have a core set of plugins that get delivered as um, as a tied update. So when you update the platform, you update sometimes Jenkins core, but then a set of these verified plugins in fixed versions, and the, that combination has been pre-tested. So that, that gets, gets to that to some extent, but there, there's still a pretty long tail of uncategorized other plugins. Is there a way to deprecate plugins? Yes. And, more commonly, people put plugins up for adoption. It means I don't care about this technology anymore. I'm not interested in doing anything else with it. But if anyone is, please take over. So, yes? Is there any way to dump a dependency graph of your plugins? Is there any way to dump a dependency graph of your plugins? Yeah, so, yeah, so if you wanted to know what, what you actually could turn off. Um, yeah, there are some ways to do that. I mean, one, one way that you can do that, for some reason, scrolling seems to have stopped working on, on this system. I don't know why. But if you, if, you, uh, oh, if you go to the Installed tab and you, you see all these um, grayed out checkboxes or plugins that are being used by something else. Um, so you could say, um, for example, is this matrix project plugin, it's a custom project type, can I turn that off? And no, it says it cannot be disabled because it's being used by the following other plugins. That doesn't mean that it's being actively used. A lot of times it just means there's some sort of integration between them and it's not really using it, but you can't turn it off right now. Um, CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise also includes a little tool that lets you look for configuration usages of certain plugins in your job. So if you have hundreds of jobs and you just want to know whether a given plugin is ever actually used, you can do that. But that's a sort of a different question. Does that work with pipeline as well? No, but I know how to fix that. <laughs> yes. So the question was about Groovy in, in a pipeline script. Does that run on the master? Yes, all of the code in a pipeline script is run on the master in process. It's intended to be glue code, and all the real work is supposed to be done by shell or batch steps, or, or now PowerShell steps that run something outside on the agent. Yes? Last question, There's please. There's a bunch of plugins yes. that come with, um, like, the restore part of Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to use like, a list of whatever plugins are in there that aren't part of that? So the question was, there's a bunch of plugins that come as core in Jenkins or really offered by default in the setup wizard. And then what what isn't in there? Well, basically, you just go to the available tab, and you'll see this endless, endless list. No, no, no. But, <laughs> Oh, oh, what you have installed that's not included in that list. No, there isn't. That might be useful. All right, that's it for time. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll be at the Ask the Experts booth much of tomorrow if you have some more questions or feedback. So.